Hey folks, David Stewart here. Hope you guys are having a fantastic day. I want to talk about quiet quitting. I'm going to talk about it with you. I'd like to hear some comments about it. Uh, and the millennial, and I guess the Gen Z, Zoomer generation. Why I think it's sort of a unique thing for them. And a little bit about the teaching profession because I noticed it really a lot when I was a teacher. And have only recently kind of put everything together and be like, oh, this explains why people had this incorrect attitude. Um, anyway, little preamble. I didn't know what quiet quitting was. I saw lots of people talking about it. I saw articles. I never clicked on them and read them because I thought it was just like, oh, millennials are uh, quiet quitting. Gen Z is quiet quitting. And I thought they were maybe being the guy from Office Space, like, I'm just going to not do my work until they fire me and they find another job. I'm going to see how far I can just not do my work. And I'm like, okay, that's, you know, I guess that's a strategy. I mean, it's not maybe the best strategy long term, but whatever, you know, maybe that that generation's just messed up and they refuse to, you know, just find another job that they like better or uh, I don't know, they have some other reason for doing that. That's not what quiet quitting was, I guess. Quiet quitting is just doing your job. So, uh I always thought quiet quitting was just the normal thing you did. It's like, oh, you're just doing your job and nothing else. Yeah, that's called doing your job. That's the normal state of affairs, at least for my generation and anyone else I ever had contact with. Um, yeah, you showed up to work, you have a job to do, you do it. That doesn't mean you're lazy, right? This is a, something I hear from boomers. Oh, they're lazy, quiet quitting, just doing their job. I never had any problems just doing my job in any job. I always, uh, you know, either got tenure as a teacher or got advanced, you know, never had problems just doing my, now you do your job with hundred percent competency, but you don't just do a bunch of unpaid overtime, particularly when you're a salaried employee. That was a big joke, even as far back as the nineties is like managers trying to uh, manipulate their little underlings into doing a lot of unpaid overtime. Um, to get more work out of them without having to pay them any extra. It was, it was a sinister thing and honestly something we consider silly. However, I realized kids born in the 90s and later had a really different experience than those of us who were born in the 70s and 80s and maybe even the 60s as far as our relationship with institutions and our attachment issues. Uh, all of us had absentee parents to some extent. That is, we were spending most of our time not with our parents, but with strangers, with teachers, with other kids, with coaches, with daycare providers. But if you were born in the 1980s or earlier, chances are you might've been a latchkey kid. And that just meant you got out of school. And I remember this, we would get out of school and the gate, like they had like a couple of gates, I think, but like they would just let the kids go. The kids would just walk off campus um, there was like a teacher or, you know, like an administrator who'd watch the kids getting on the buses. The other kids, we just walk off campus and go home. No adults around, no adults in the neighborhood. Everyone was gone. Everyone was work. It was, you know, the suburbs and just deserted. You get on your bike and go ride through the park or do whatever you wanted until you felt like your parents were going to be home or you just go home and open it up. And there was an empty house. Uh, and I had this in the gen Y book Afterglow, generation Y. It's like you'd get home, the air conditioner would be on, you'd throw your back down, you'd avoid like doing your chores that your parents wanted you to do, maybe turn on the TV, play a game or something, or like just watch TV, MTV Total Request Live if it was the 1990s, right? Or something like that. You would just, you know, do whatever when you got home. Well, I mean, that transitioned into a daycare generation. A lot of my childhood was spent in daycare. I went to school all day. Then I was at daycare for like five or six at night. Then I go to sports. So I had some of that 1990s kid experience. And uh, certainly when I was in high school, it was like a very unsupervised uh, experience with a lot of um, just busy stuff having to do with school and extracurriculars. Well, it got a lot worse, I guess. Um, so that kids born after 1990, and I was teaching them like guitar and stuff in the 2000s and 2010s, or uh, you know, teaching at schools. I was a school teacher, I was a college professor, uh, did a bunch of different things. But anyway, these kids were busy from the time they woke up till the time they went to sleep with zero personal time. Was was how their childhood was. Maybe they got Sunday afternoons off, uh, but it was like they woke up, they went to school, they were at school all day until three. Then they went to daycare, or maybe if they were older, they went to like an after-school sport. Um, 
but they went to daycare and then their parents picked them up and took them to soccer practice and they got home at seven, ate dinner, went to sleep or had to do an hour to three hours worth of homework and go to sleep exhausted with zero time to play or just be a kid. Um, other than maybe the 20 minutes, the precious 20 minutes of recess at school, maybe a little bit of playtime at daycare. But um, if daycare was like what I had uh, towards the end of elementary school, it was like, welcome to daycare, do your homework. And I still had homework left over when I got home. I do homework for two hours, go home and still do more homework, right? In like fifth grade. Um, you know, well, that's why you're against homework. You had to do homework. It's like, no, I grew up and became a teacher and realized how bad homework was. That's a whole nother video on why you shouldn't assign homework. But anyway, that's the life of the 90s kid. It's just hyper micromanaged. So people be, oh, they didn't know what the real world was like. They never had any exposure to the real world. They never had any personal agency until they got turned loose as adults and realized that the real world was not what was told to them when they were uh, 15. And they that the things that they were told to do in school did not benefit them in the way that they were told it would benefit them. Working hard, doing extra, got them no reward at work. That's why uh, they started to quite quit is that they were institutionalized and institutionalized to believe in a mindset that was a lie. And you hear boomers and most of the boomers who complain about the lazy generation uh, don't know what it's like. Uh, they don't, they're not working the jobs where they receive no reward for doing anything extra, no promotions, no raises, nothing. Uh, and it's basically proven at this point, if you actually want to make more money rather than trying to get a raise at your job, you just get another job because all of the budget is in, I guess, hiring new people. I've had this from several subscribers. They're like, yeah, um, you know, all of the, there's zero attempt to retain the employees you have and all of the energy is in finding new employees. So there's always this turnover. And each time you do turnover years, there's like an increase in salary to try to attract more talent or whatever. So the easiest way to make more money is to just job pop, right? Um, but you don't get that re the reward. So boomers are not living that experience, but a lot of them are managers. And so the joke in the 1990s was like managers trying to get you to work unpaid overtime. Of course they want the kids to work unpaid overtime because it get, it benefits them. I want them to be a slave because it will make me look better. It, it's better for my bottom line if uh, my employees are more like slaves. And the thing is, people thought I was being very extreme when I called said employees are like slaves or uh, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb said employees are slaves, but that's what they want to treat people. It's not like you have a job, you're being paid to do this specific job. Like a plumber comes to a house, he does a plumbing job, he gets paid the amount that he said that it's worth, right? He doesn't quite quit. He does his plumbing job and he does it competently, hopefully, hopefully competently, and your toilet doesn't explode or something, and gets paid for it. And that's all, all the, quote, quiet quitters are saying is work should be like that. Work should be, I get compensated to do the things that you want me to do, and I don't have to do a bunch of extra things as though you own me like a slave. But you think about how... Um, millennials and Gen Z and we were even my can you know my generation to extent how we were conditioned to feel and think and act when it comes to the institutions that we were involved with we were told that school was like a family and I've seen lots of videos about why teachers are quitting and one of the things I see on some of them is like they have on their bulletin board we are a family that's wildly inappropriate but it also speaks a lot to the issues that you have you don't have your family around you're not spending your time with your real family. You're not spending your time with your real parents. You're spending your time with teacher and you're spending your time with coach. And so they grow up and what do they want to do? They want to be a teacher and they want to be a coach, just like how a little kid wants to grow up and be just like dad. I asked my son, what do you want to be when you grow up? He's like, I want to be a writer and a musician and an artist. I want to do all these great things. And I'm like, is there anything you want to do that would be more valuable? He's like, I want to like maybe be a programmer, right? He has lots of things that he thinks like, oh, I could do this and someone might want this of me, but I would really want to write and I want to create stories, you know? Uh, because that's the stuff that I do, right? He wants to feel like dad. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when you don't spend any time with your real dad, who becomes your dad? It becomes your teacher, your coach, your principal, your band director, right? Who becomes your mom? It becomes your teacher. So a lot of teachers, uh, millennial teachers, get into the, uh, they get into the profession not because it like resonates with their skill set. Think about the skill set you have to have to be a teacher. You have to have time management skills. You have to have... A, big time people management skills. Most of um, most of being a good teacher is classroom management. 
And if you're not good at classroom management, you will never be a good teacher. You will never instruct anybody with anything because your room will be chaos and no one will learn. So you have to have excellent people management skills. You have to be very organized. You have to know how to break down tasks into steps. There's a lot of mental things that go into being a teacher and a lot of personality things. You have to be charismatic. You have to be uh, able to enforce rules and enforce discipline and connect with people and manage them, right? You have to have management skills. You have to have all these skills to be a teacher. So a lot of people don't get into the profession because they're like, man, I'm charismatic. I'm good. I want to manage people. I'm organ- you know, I'm organized. This like resonates with who I am. They're like, I want to help kids. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to help kids. That's a beautiful sentiment. But then they get to the classroom and they realized, oh, teaching is actually not helping kids. It's teaching. And it's all of these things that I didn't realize my teachers were having to do and put up with all the time. That it's a bunch of paperwork, a bunch of BS. Uh, One kid can ruin your entire day by not doing what it's like. Why don't the kids like me? Because you're like the prison guard. Why would they like you? They don't want to be there. Because just because you wanted to be in school doesn't mean that your students want to be in school. They don't want to be in school, most of them. They want to be anywhere besides in your classroom. So why would they just do what you want them to do because they like you? They don't like you. They hate you. They hate you because you're a prison guard. You're part of the system that they don't like. Sorry, you got to deal with it. I was a teacher. Students hated me. It's fine. Some students like me. Some students like me relative to other teachers because of my professionalism or my personal separation or because I didn't I didn't ask them to do a bunch of pointless busy work that they hated. I didn't treat them like garbage slaves or whatever. So there's lots of reasons that kids might have hated me as part of the system. Uh, And I enforced rules and I didn't let them do whatever they wanted. Or they might have loved me because I was better than other teachers or I treated them like a human being. I had a student once say, like, you were the only teacher that really taught me important things about life. And I had a student say, like, you were the only teacher I had that treated me like I was a like an adult, like I was a human being worth talking to and listening to. It's like, I never had a teacher say what I asked, what I thought about a lesson or what I thought about what I was doing or what I thought I might do. Like it had never had, never happened. So anyway, those are just anecdotes. It's not, I'm saying, not saying I'm a great teacher, but it's going to happen. Like teachers are not going to like you. So teachers who have this idea of like, I'm going to make a family in a classroom. We are a family is posted on the, on the bulletin board then it's not that, right? I think the same thing happens in a lot of workplaces is that uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's just a lot of BS language that gets used in the corporate world. They'll say that we're a family or we're a team. Well, maybe you're a team, but you're definitely not a family. A family is a family, not a team, but they're really wanting employees to have attachment issues that are related to work. It's like, you remember how you feel about your family? We want you to feel about that, about the corporation which will probably lay you off uh, when it's convenient for us. After you're done with your projects, we'll fire you. But, uh, you know, in the meantime, you should put your all into the company. You should be doing everything that's possible to help the company succeed, right? Ask a game developer what that's like. Oh, yeah, I busted my ass. I did crunch time. And then after the product shipped and they made millions of dollars, they fired half of us because they didn't have another project lined up for us to do. Out the window you go. Let's save some salary money. Here's your reward for all that hard work. A pink slip, one month severage, severance pay, because it's cheaper than keeping you on for six months till we have another project for you to do. Uh, things like that. So, yeah, of course they're quiet quitting. That's waking up to the reality of the world, and it's like making a big deal over them going, "Oh, I realize that I should actually be acting in the normal way every other prior generation treated their job, which is to show up, be competent at my job, not do extra things, leave after when I'm contracted to leave, and go home and have a life, right?" Go home and have a little bit of leisure time. There's a difference between an employee and a business owner. That's the other thing too, is business owners are like, man, I'm so excited. Yeah, it's your business. An employee that you hire to do tasks for you, that's not his business. And no matter what, he's not going to be as excited or invested in it as you are because he's literally not invested in it. He's an employee. So yeah, just doing your job, that's called being an employee. My bigger point is I think these younger generations, because of how institutionalized they were by the school system, they have incorrect attachment to institutions, to things like school and work. And then you wake up to the reality that that's an incorrect attachment, that's an uh, unhealthy attachment, that you aren't getting what you want to 
uh, you're not getting extra for your extra effort. In fact, you may actually be getting less. Uh, common thing, you do extra. Here's some extra work as a reward. I noticed Bob is like really like willing to do extra stuff. We should just have Bob do it, you know? So yeah, wake up, quiet, quit. That's just called doing your job. So, uh, you know, this isn't like career advice or anything, but it's really just what I notice about um, people born a little bit later is that because, you know, 80s and 70s kids, we were latchkey kids. Yeah, our parents weren't around. So maybe we have unhealthy attachment issues, but they're not towards school, which we, which we didn't like. Um, rather, they're towards other things that are different, like uh, movies, you know, and it's like unhealthy attachment to Star Wars. That's part of Gen Y and Gen X to, uh, to an extent, right? Uh, whereas millennials is like unhealthy attachment to school and the idea of being uh, in a in a school environment anyway that's my big point there leave me your thoughts down below about quiet quitting gen Z, and uh the millennial generation and maybe why you think they're waking up to this and starting to act in a normal professional way right this is a professional attitude uh the last thing i'll say about um teaching up I'll, I'll probably have a floor like a longer article come out on Substack about uh, teaching and quiet quitting and quitting, why teachers are quitting. Uh, I think a lot of it is that they have the wrong idea about what teaching is. Um, they want it to be this spiritually fulfilling endeavor where they're just helping kids and the realities of it is that it's a job. And uh, if you want to prosper as a teacher, you actually have to view it as a job. You have to have really strong boundaries. Um, and I think that's appropriate for every job. Have a boundary that says like, no, after this, I'm not giving my time to this work. I'm giving my time to my family. I'm giving my time to myself um, and investing in myself. Okay, what are you going to do with that extra time while you're not giving extra to your employer? Like you could build more skills to get a better job further on down the road. There's lots of things you can do. So anyway, leave me your thoughts down below. I would love to read them. Of course, you can uh, join my Patreon, patreon.com slash David V. Stewart. Get free books and things. This month's free book is Eyes in the Walls. I don't think I have it, but no, here it is. Eyes in the walls. Still get last. I'll also give you last month's free book, Water of Awakening. Um, and everybody gets a free copy of Keys to Prolific Creativity. This is about time management and mindset geared towards being uh, prolific as a creator, getting your projects done on time, under budget, completing them getting them out to an audience, all that kind of stuff is in this book. Um, I've had lots of people give feedback like this book helped me to write a book because the problem was not I didn't know how to write the words. And this is the thing that I found even with musicians. The problem is that they don't is not that they don't know how to play the notes on the page. The problem is that they don't know how to manage their time and their expectations to get to the gig to practice enough to where they get good and then to be able to take it out and perform with it. Same thing with writing a book, to be able to sit down, write, create the product, accept the limitations of what you're doing and know that, you know, it's not gonna be perfect, publish it and get it out. That's what that book's about. So leave me your thoughts down below. I've said that several times now, but I really am curious, uh, especially about the experience of Gen Z, Gen Z, the Zoomers and, uh, how your experience with school is because I keep getting this uh, feedback. It's like we were told to put everything into school. So everything was school. And then when we got out and got into the real world and was like, everything we were told was a lie. It's like, I feel you because, um, you know, for my generation, it was go get a college degree and then you got it. And it's like, get it at any cost. Just take out loans. There were all kinds of loan officers at the school just ready to throw money at you. But you could do whatever you wanted with. You could buy a house with your student loans if you wanted to, right? And then they got out in the real world and it wasn't all that it was cracked up to be. So anyway, guys, have a great one and I will see you all next time. My color's going a little crazy. It's fun. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Have a great one.